Uh, let me begin. We're going to be looking at these verses, verses 15 through 18. We'll look at some of the verses as well. But uh, let me just begin by putting ourselves in the context of where we're at here in Romans and where we've been in Romans for some time. We are faced with or being presented to us in this moment, in this passage that we're looking with, with two different kingdoms that are vying for this world. There's the kingdom that belongs to Satan. It's the kingdom of this age, and, and he would like to maintain that kingdom indefinitely. And, and then there is the kingdom that God is advancing and will bring upon all the earth, and it's found in the redemption of Jesus Christ. And these two kingdoms are in opposition to one another. The question really is, which kingdom do you belong to? Because you either belong to one kingdom or the other. That's how it works. And we just read a wonderful passage in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, among all the verses we read there in 1 Colossians. And there we read this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, that is, from the kingdom of darkness, and translated us, conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son of love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's bow our heads, let's pray. It's in that incredible reality that we give you praise and thanks. And a reality that we need to be uh, clearly aware of, O oh God. Bring into focus and sharp review for our minds as we consider our lives past, our lives present. The kingdoms that are in conflict in this age and in this world help us to realize and recognize the great power that was exerted by your son Jesus Christ in delivering us from the hold of darkness and from its servitude and bringing us into uh, the claim of grace just as tenacious oh even stronger still transforming us and changing us into your servants and those who serve the kingdom of light Lord Jesus I pray dear God you'd make this clear to those who are uncertain at this point in time that think that somehow the world is just up to their own uh, independent pathway and their own choosing and they make their own course for themselves and not recognizing that they stand, they stand either in one kingdom or the other. There is a consequential decision that stands before them, which kingdom they would belong to and which kingdom they will serve. And Lord, may these things, make these things clear and also make clear the pathway and the avenue through which we we pass out of darkness and come to light through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. We need your spirit for this, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week I pointed out to you verse 13 of Romans chapter 6. Let me read it to you. And have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to stay there, and hopefully I'll keep, your, I'll keep you uh, focused on these passages. But we looked at this passage in verse 13 that says, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And um, I made the mention that whenever an individual chooses or begins to act out sin, when they act upon the temptation that's laid before them, when they yield to that temptation and give themselves over to sin, there is, they're not just somehow inexorably drawn into it. There is a moment in which they themselves, the, the, the spiritual individual they are, present their bodies and they present themselves into that activity, into that sin. There's a moment of presentation in which they give themselves to that sin or that unrighteousness. That's what takes place. That's a part of the decision. That's why God holds you accountable for your actions. At the same time, it's true that when you serve God and you yield to Him and you seek to obey Him, God does not ever overwhelm or, or bypass this this act of surrender on your part, this act of presentation on your part, where you yield up your body and yourself to honor Him and glorify Him and serve Him, and you give your body to present yourself to Him in that way. And, and so the, the real thing I hope you're seeing here is uh, what's being a asked of us. And actually what happens, that word when it says present your body, it, it says don't present your body to sin. And the, and the Greek word has the idea... Don't give your body to the disposal of sin, giving it up to the disposal of sin, but give your body up to the disposal or at the disposal of righteousness and the righteous way that God would have us live. And, and so really what's at play here again is this issue of which kingdom you're going to give yourself to, which kingdom you're going to serve. Are you going to put your body and the members of your body and your abilities and your 
energetic powers, your physical powers and your mental powers at the disposal of the kingdom of darkness? Or, or are you going to yield your body and all your powers and energies to the disposal of the kingdom of the Son of God's love? Now, what I did having said that was then I pivoted to this idea of present your body as instruments. And as we spoke about this idea of presenting your body as instru instruments, my imagination got away with me. And I associated it, your body, as a, and I did this very briefly. You might not have picked up on it at all. I did. I, you associated your body as like a musical instrument that you yield up to God so that his spirit might breathe through it and work through it to perform and express his glory and his power and his beauty. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good analogy. And I think the analogy holds true. And it, it may actually kind of work with uh, Ephesians chapter 2.10 where the Bible says we are God's workmanship. And the word their workmanship is is the Greek word poema. It's the word from which we get poem, although there's not a direct correlation. It's the idea that God expresses his craft and his handiwork through us. And that may be a parallel to that analogy that I, that I set forward very briefly of our bodies as musical instruments. But actually, that's not the analogy that Paul is making in this passage when he uses the word instrument. The word instrument there in the Greek actually means a weapon of warfare. That's the analogy he's making. You're either presenting your body in sin as a weapon of warfare in the enemy's hands to strike against the kingdom of God's light and the kingdom of God's truth, or you are presenting your body as righteousness into righteousness as a weapon of light in God's hand that strikes out against the darkness. And the illustration puts before us the choice that God leads us and that Paul is bringing us to in this section. It's this. What are you going to present your body to? What will you present your life to? It will either be one of two things. You're either going to present yourself to sin as a weapon of darkness, or you're going to present yourself and your body to righteousness as a weapon of God and of His light. So these are the things we're considering. Now, take your Bibles and let's go to verse 15. That's a little bit of an apology for what we looked at in the past, and it sets the mood, you might say, for what we're going to consider here. In verse 15, uh, Paul is repeating a question that's been asked of him in verse 1. And the question is, if we're, under, we're not under the law anymore, but we're under grace, uh, why don't we just go on sinning? That's the question in question 1. Why don't we just go on sinning that grace might abound? And, and now in question number 15, it's repeated. But now it's, why don't we just sin? Why don't we just choose and pick our sin that we're going to commit in order that grace may abound? And, and Paul's immediate answer to this question is, God forbid. That's how it is in the old King James. It's certainly not absolutely not. May it never be. That's the idea of the word there. And just for a moment, you, you know, it's an emotional response to a suggestion that's being made. Paul is at the moment, he's putting aside providing any kind of intellectual response to the question, and he's emoting at this very suggestion. And this is appropriate. There have been times in your lives when suggestions have been made to you, and someone has put forward an, to, an idea to you that is completely antithetical to what you value and what is in your heart of hearts, and your immediate response is, are you kidding? Or, don't be silly, or don't be ridiculous, or never, not a chance. And it's an appropriate response to give. After having given that emotional response, by the way, I suggest that you then explain yourself. And that's what Paul does. He's going to explain himself. And, and by the way, this is a good rule for parents. You know, Children will bring you to situations in which you're going to say to them, are you kidding? You're not going to do that. You, you make your emotional response first. You, you, you shout at them when they're getting ready to run out in the middle of the traffic and you make them stop. And it's then after that, you pull them aside. Now, this is always your obligation. Having put down your law with some sense of emotion and firmness, your obligation is to explain yourself. That's what Paul does in this passage. Paul first sets down the, the definitive statement, I will never, never, may it never be. But then... Paul explains himself. And hey, here's another thing when we look at verse 15, we've got to realize as we're understanding what's here in verse 15 is you, you see here that those who are listening to Paul, even those who are not conceding to his message, are understanding that Paul is teaching that the Christian is no longer living under the moral law as a basis for establishing or gaining the righteousness. It's been completely set aside and the law has no play in whether they are right before God or not right before God. It doesn't bring them into a state of and right standing before God whatsoever. And it's only through God's grace that God freely provides that they can be right before God. And they calculate, well, this is true, then well, 
Why follow the law at all? Why do anything that's obedient at all? Why don't we just keep on sinning and just rely upon grace to put us right before God? And, but here's the thing I think you need to see that Paul's saying when Paul says we're not under law. Paul is acknowledging that every individual has a law that weighs in upon and dictates the way they live. It's either as the Jews had, they had the law of the Ten Commandments that had been given to them, it was written in stone, or like the pagans or the Gentiles in this situation, they just had a, a conscious law that was dictating to them moral principles that they were to live by. And everyone's instinct is to retrieve those laws and then lay those laws as the foundation by which, as they follow those laws, they establish their own righteousness. And Paul is saying, yeah, you're not under that pattern. You're not under that, that, that direction, that, that means or, or avenue through which you can establish righteousness. And the reason why is, first of all, as Paul has already told us, it doesn't work. You can't establish your righteousness through the law. Here's what's happening. It will give you the standard of righteousness, but then it will reveal to you that you can't follow it. You can't follow the Ten Commandments. You can't even follow the dictates of your own conscience. You break them on a regular basis. And so if you think you're going to be right by keeping all these standards and these laws, you're wrong. It won't work. It'll actually do the other, th other way. It'll work the other way. It will aggravate your conscience to realize what a, a sinner you are. And so you're not under the law... You're under grace. It won't accomplish what you're trying to accomplish through the law. And then the next thing Paul says is, you're not only not under the law in terms of being able to establish your righteousness through the following of the law, but you're now not under the jeopardy or the sentence or judgment of the law. Because the law says the soul that sins will surely die. The law says that if you're guilty in one part in the law, you're guilty of all of it as a lawbreaker. And you bring upon yourself the curse of the law. And Paul's saying, yeah, you're... You're also a believer because you're under grace. You're not under the jeopardy of the law. You're not under the sentence or judgment that the law has brought against you and convicting you of your sin and revealing to you your own failures. In consequence, instead, you're under grace. By grace, what I mean is Paul is saying that you're, you're now under a righteousness that you've received and been given to you that you didn't accomplish on your own. Jesus Christ has lived that perfectly sinless, righteous life, and as you put your faith and belief in Him, He... He puts upon you all of His righteousness. And you're on the righteousness that He accomplished through the law perfectly and sinlessly. And it's yours. And that's what you're under. And you receive it by grace. It's a free gift that's given to you by faith in Him. And, and being under grace, you're also under the impulse of that righteousness now because He lives in you. He abides in you by His Holy Spirit. And He's producing within you the principle or the power of His own righteousness. And He is going to conduct you or guide you into a life of righteousness. How wonderful. How wonderful to be rescued from the jeopardy of the law and from the judgment of the law and be delivered up into a righteous standing before God that comes through Jesus alone and, and through an energy, an impulse that helps you to be and do and live as you, you can't be and do and live in your own strength and your own power. I kind of know what it's like to be under the jeopardy of a law in a certain way and under the judgment of a law. We, we might remember when we were little children, you know, when I grew up, you had... Sunday morning service, you had Sunday evening service. Sunday evening service got out and all the kids would go out into the, in the church parking lot and we'd play. We'd play tag, we'd play all kinds of games. I was rather aggressive when I played those games. There was always some kid that I did something wrong to that tattled on me. And um, as a result of that, on more occasions than I would, can remember, I was sent to the car by my father, who was the pastor. Joel, uh, go to the car and when you get home, you were going to answer for this. I'm going to discipline you. You're in trouble. Just go to the car. And, you know, then they lingered for an hour or a half hour of visiting. And you just sat in the car while the other kids were playing out in the parking lot. And you knew that your future held this spanking that was waiting for you when you got home. And, and our church was a long ways away from the, our home was a long ways away from the church as well. So you had to endure that drive all the way. You're calculating your mind. Should I, when I get home, should I pretend to be asleep? That's a good way. Or, or should I remind my dad that I have discipline so it'll go easy on me? Or should I be quiet and hope that he's totally forgot about it? Oh, you know what you're doing? You're living under the jeopardy of the law. You're living under its judgments. It's a cloud that weighs upon you. And in some sense, that's how men are living today. Trying to prove that they're righteous, but they can't escape their own conscience. They're living under the guilt of that sin, and they know that there's an answer, and they know that there's a righteousness that they've not fulfilled, and they know that there's a, a payment and a judgment that's to be paid, and, and all that they live under that cloud. And Paul says, by grace, you're no longer under that cloud. And 
been delivered. They're not under that jeopardy whatsoever. How wonderful. Now, there's one more thing I want to show you about this verse 15. It's asking basically the same question you have in verse 1 of chapter 6. And uh, Paul is going to answer these questions twice. The first time that Paul answers this question, he answers us it by showing us what God has done for us in bringing to us new life. That when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, at that moment we are drawn into the death of Jesus Christ for our sins and our old nature and that fallen sinful man dies with Christ in that death that he died on the cross. And in his resurrection, we are brought into the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And we rise in Jesus Christ to a new life to become new creatures in Jesus Christ. He's, he's saying we cannot continue in sin because God has done something miraculous and wonderful for us. And we're new creatures. He's regenerated us. He's redeemed us. And so the answer that Paul gives to the question the first time is, well, let me remind you what God has done in us in providing for us his salvation. But now when Paul answers the question the second time, the focus that he gives is not what God has done for us, but what we have done for God, what we did when we came to God and we gave ourselves to God and we turned to Him. And so he's now focusing upon that moment of conversion when we turned our life over to Him. So the first answer is, well, we can't continue in sin because of what God has done in us. And the second answer is, and we can't continue in sin or go on sinning because of what we did when we gave our lives to Him. So let's, let's look at that second response here. Let's look at verse 16. And here's what Paul says in verse 16 now. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slave to, slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness. And here, what's being focused upon is a change, a turn that took place when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And it was a change in our relationship with sin to a relationship with the Savior. The first is a relationship with sin that leads to death. And you might actually expect that when Paul finishes saying that, that he's going to say the next relationship is a relationship with Jesus that leads to life or leads to righteousness. Or it's a relationship to righteousness that leads to life. But he doesn't say that. He says it's a relationship to obedience. Do you see that there? It's a relationship to sin that leads to death. And then he says it's a relationship to obedience that leads to righteousness. Uh, it is if he says now you, instead of obeying sin, you obey obedience. And it leads to righteousness. And what Paul is doing is he's, he's emphasizing the nature of this new relationship. It's a new relationship that is driving us into a new a new direction of obedience in our lives. It is drawing us into a new form of obedience that is producing in us an ongoing burgeoning, expressing, developing righteousness. And now we know because he's already told us we're not under the law and not under that a pursuit of righteousness who fall in the law, that what he's saying is we're not now under obedience that leads to obeying all the laws so that we can say that we're righteous. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is we've now discover an obedience or we've come into a relationship obedience in which the righteousness that has become ours begins to flourish and expand and express itself through our lives. It's, it's like it takes over our lives. It's a, it's a life that comes from Jesus Christ. It's a life that comes from coming into a relationship with the righteous Savior. And then He fills us and He meets us with Himself and He draws us by His own life and His own power in our communion with Him into obedience with Him and to Him, and to do what is right before God. But here's the thing I want you to see here in verse 16. The first thing I want you to see about your conversion to Christ is this. It was a change or a turn from what you were going to obey. Conversion, coming to Christ, believing in Him, was a change and a turn from what you were going to obey. And, and here's what lies at the heart of your relationship with sin, with the world, with Satan, with your own flesh, when you're consigned to it and living in it, before you come to Jesus Christ, before you give your life to Him, the person who's just living in the world, unbelieving in Jesus Christ, just going about thinking they're living an independent life, actually, they have a relationship with sin. They have a relationship with the world around them. They have a relationship with the God of this age. And the relationship is basically this. It's a relationship of obedience. It's a relationship of obedience. And here's what lies in the relationship you form when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Here's what lies behind that faith in Him. You turn to obey Him. 
and not to obey sin and Satan and the God of this age any longer. And those are your options. Your life, whether you know it or not, is not one of independence. You don't simply make your own choices and do your own thing. You might live under that illusion before you come to Jesus Christ that you were just your own man, your own self, determining your own direction, your own way, but you weren't. You were under the bondage and you were under the control and you were under the direction and you were yielding yourself in obedience to the God of this age. And the Spirit. And he'll, by the way, He'll let you do it in any way that you like as long as He's getting what He wants from you. Your obedience, your concession. And so when you come to Christ and you believe in Him, you're, you're actually coming to transition what it is you're going to obey because you're going to obey something. I mentioned the other day, it's the old song that... Um, was sung by the folk singer, I just forgot his name. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, yeah, there it is. You may serve the devil or you may serve the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. It was the old song that he sang. That's the idea. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the Lord Jesus makes it very clear that this is the, this is the choice that's before you. This is the issue of faith. This is the issue. It's whether you're going to serve him or whether you're going to serve the God of this age. There he says it in a different way. He says you're either hot or cold. Speaking to the church in Laodicea, I have something against you because you're lukewarm. He says, you're either hot or cold, and if you're, if you're not, so I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're either for me, Jesus says in another place, he actually says it in Matthew chapter 20, 12, verse 30. He, he actually says, you're either for me or against you. He actually says, whoever is not for me is against me. By default, you're against me. If you're not living in complete surrender to me and obedience to me, and so that's what's before us. You either turn to obey Him and not obey sin any longer, or you continue thinking you're independent, but you're serving the other master. You're serving sin. You're serving Satan. You're serving the God of this world. You're not serving the God of grace and the God of salvation. You're going to live in obedience to one or the other. That's the idea here. Paul actually uses the illustration or analogy of a slave here. And John Stott points out that in, uh, in that time period, there were these individuals who were slaves by conquest. They, they involuntarily became slaves. But there are other individuals, because of their impoverishment or the difficulty of their lives and looking for some form of security, would enslave themselves in order to make it on in the world. But these individuals didn't know that... Uh, that although they enslaved, and, and, and at some point in time, it gave them some comfort, it gave them some courage, it helped them to carry on with their lives, but it never ended. Once they enslaved themselves, they were forever the slave of the individual that they enslaved themselves to. They were in bondage the rest of their lives. They would work until that work that was given for them by their masters drew out their last breath, their last sweat, drop of sweat, their last drop of blood, then that's your relationship to sin and self. You might think that it has brought you out from the cold and enriched your life with some pleasure, but it's only going to last for a short while. And eventually you're going to discover that you've sold yourself into slavery and your master is not going to let you go until he's done with you. And he's let, going to let you go in death. That's the point here. But this too is the relationship of conversion. When you turn to Christ, he buys you and he redeems you from that master sin and Satan and he claims you for his own and your relationship with Jesus is also a relationship of obedience but his rule is one of grace and life and purpose and he doesn't extract his pay from you instead he just keeps giving into your life and keeps putting into your life and he fills you and floods you with the impulses and activities of a changed and glad obedience to his goodness and his graciousness and his kindness and his love and this faith that saved us when we gave ourselves to Christ, was a faith that then brought us into obedience to Him. That's it. It brought us into obedience to Him. Choosing to sin is a surrender into obedience. And choosing salvation, understand this, choosing salvation through Jesus Christ is the same thing. The matter of your conversion is only a matter regarding who or what you're going to obey. Now here's the next thing. Let's look at verse 17. Paul then says, But God be thanked that through, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now when he says that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, he's referring to this gospel message that he's been preaching, that 
you're in judgment and you're in sin, that, that your morality doesn't make you right before God, your religion doesn't make you right before God, that you can't find a right standing before God in the following of laws. Instead, you're a sinner, and your sin produces judgment and brings judgment on your life, but God has sent His Son to die for you in your place. And God loves you and redeem you if you put your faith in Him and you'd surrender to Him. And that's the gospel, that's the doctrine that was preached to them. And he says, you obeyed from the heart this word, you received it. And, and Paul, in remembering that and thinking of that, says, just thank God. Thank God that's true. He can't hold it back. And I, you might know this experience. You're praying for someone, you're longing for them to come into salvation and faith in Jesus Christ, and you see that they're making wrong choices and decisions, and they're going in the wrong direction, and then the word comes to you, or maybe you're with them in the moment in which their life turns, and they change, and they surrender to Him, and they believe in Him. Oh, what a song of praise raises up from your own heart. What a doxology raises up from your own heart. It's happened, it's happened to me many, many times. What great praise from the heart, God has brought about a change in them. God has stirred their hearts to turn to them and they put their faith in them. And they, they in that moment, have entered into this life in which they've, been, they've, they've unleashed themselves from their bondage to sin and they've entered into this, this fellowship and relationship with God in which now they're delivered and they're following Him. Here's the thing. The saving faith that we're speaking about is a deep heart turn into obedience. Do you see that? Yet you obeyed from the heart. This issue of faith, what is it? It's just a turn of obedience to what God has revealed, this wonderful gospel message. And it's an act of obedience that believes in Jesus Christ for salvation and a believing in Him that surrenders to His ongoing command. In other words, a measure of true faith in Christ as Savior is that it's an act of obedience that issues in a life of obedience. It just changes the trajectory of your life. You'll remember that at the very beginning of the book of Romans, Paul says that God has set him apart as an apostle, as, an, a mission, as a missionary, to speak out the gospel to the nations and call them to the obedience of faith. That's what he says. His message was a message calling the nations to the obedience of faith. When the Lord Jesus declares to those and, and comes before men and calls them to believe upon him, to believe upon him with such a commitment that their belief would be like eating him and partaking of him, totally taking in his life. That's what he's calling them to do. Totally putting all their faith in them. The Lord Jesus says that this is the work that God gave man to do, to believe in him. Actually, John chapter 6, verses 27 through 29. Let me read them to you. John chapter 6, verses 27 through 29. Jesus says, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Lord Jesus has just announced as Himself, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal on Him. And then they said to Him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? What's the labor? What's the thing we have to do to prove ourselves righteous? And then He said to them, He said to Him, They said to Him, excuse me, and then Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. Now, the Lord Jesus declares this and calls him to this radical faith. Just These are the same individuals who have been with him when he's multiplied the loaves and fishes and fed them. <laughs> and they've seen this tremendous miracle. And, and then the Lord Jesus makes this after he walks out onto the stormy seas out of the waters and goes to his disciples to the boat walking on the water and gets in the boat with them and takes them across the sea to Capernaum. And and now the Lord Jesus is saying, you've got to believe in me. And, and in a sense, the Lord Jesus is saying to them, I have given you enough warrant to believe what I'm telling you and commanding you. And in fact, I've proven myself to such an extent that not to believe in me is an act of resistance and obedience to the truth or disobedience to the truth. It's an act of ongoing obedience to sin if you don't believe in me because I put the evidence before you. The work is to believe what I've put before you and revealed to you. Now, when the Bible calls us to believe in the gospel, I assume then what God is teaching us is that the God has worked in such a way by His Spirit, so powerfully and so significantly, that the gospel has a convincing warrant to it. When a person comes under its message and it's clarified and spoke to them, that it jives with the Holy Spirit has been saying in their lives. Remember, the Bible says in John chapter 16, Jesus said that, the Spirit works in the lives of all people, convicting them of sin and righteousness and judgment. He convicts them that they're sinners. He convicts them that they need to be righteous, but that they're not righteous. They can't produce the righteousness that satisfies God. And as a result, He convicts them of judgment. 
Not only that, the Lord Jesus at that time said that the, through the witness of the church, the Holy Spirit comes upon the church to bear out this conviction through the message and life of Jesus Christ. So that as we bring the message and story of Jesus Christ to people, it intensifies this internal conviction in their life. In other words, the Spirit is convicting and convincing people of the truth of the gospel. He's laying it upon them with force. And you know what? I believe it. I believe that what God is saying is true. The Bible is saying that God is presenting it with such force to individuals, even lost individuals with such force and such power, that when they refuse to believe it, it's an act of disobedience. It's an act of disobedience. The warrant is there. And when they do believe it, it's a conceding to the obedience. It's a yielding to the obedience of the truth that God has placed before them. Let me just suggest to you that when you witness the people, instead of going to them in fear, instead of just somehow trying to win the debate, that you come to them from that standpoint, that you recognize that when you hit the truth of the gospel before their lives, you're a sinner and you're never going to be right before God until you find the righteousness that He alone can give you. You'll never be able to produce it in yourself, but God has provided that righteousness through a Savior who came and lived a sinless life and loved you and died on the cross for your sins so that if you put your faith in Him, you could be made right. You're choosing and following your own way because you don't want to yield yourself to the will of God, but if you'll surrender to Him, He'll produce a righteousness within you that will abound and grow unto everlasting life. When you say that thing to a person, whether they want to reject it or not, you understand this, it rings true. The Spirit of God is at work in them. It rings true. They have to set it aside through an act of their will, through a suppression of the truth. I have in my mind an image of individuals that I've shared the gospel with, and you can just see that they're being brought under conviction. You can see that the pushback they're giving is a pushback that's just the age-old pushback because they're trying to push and create ground for themselves to maintain control for themselves. And yet you can see them brought under conviction. I remember speaking to one woman and eventually she yielded all the way along the way that everything the gospel said was true. And then the, the, the moment came to decide to surrender her life and give her life to Christ. And she said, no. I said, well, why? You've acknowledged these are true. She said, I will not because I will not. I'll do what I will. Now listen. She was brave enough to declare it. And it was good that she declared it because let that declaration, it was this, just let those words ring in your ears, man. Let them ring in your ears. May they change before you become, come before his throne. But the fact is, that's the reality behind an individual's rejection of Christ, whether you know it or not. But it also means this. When I go to share the gospel with somebody, when I go to talk to people about the Lord Jesus, there's already work going on in their lives. And what I have to say to them and how I speak to them, I don't have to be brusque or harsh. I don't have to be uh, manipulative or controlling. I don't have to somehow kind of sneak in the back door. I can just be straightforward with them. However they respond, I can believe that God's working to convict them in such a powerful way that He's actually commanding. It's so powerful. God is so confident of how He's communicating to them, whether you can see it or not, that He's commanding faith from them. You don't command from people anything that's not convincing or you know, they don't have a warrant to believe. And God is saying, I've given men warrant to believe in me. They're suppressing it. They're putting it aside. So let me encourage you along those lines to approach your witness to others with that, that sense of confidence, that sense that God is at work, that God is making himself known in creation and God is making him so known in the in instincts they have to be righteous and God is making it known in their conscience because they know they're not righteous and God is making known that He has a way of salvation for them that He can provide, alone can provide for them if they would yield to Him. And in God's mind, the evidence and the impact of His Spirit's work is so profound and so overpowering that, that not to believe in Him is an act of disobedience to righteousness and an ongoing act of obedience to sin. So now we come to like an invitation to give our lives to Jesus. We think of Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all that you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it's, it's this wonderful, gracious invitation, isn't it? It's an invitation that you come and bring to God the burden of yourself because you were created by Him and you weren't meant to sustain your own life. He was meant to sustain it. He weren't meant to live apart from Him. You're meant to live being upheld by Him. And it's, 
It's an invitation to come and bring to them the burden of your sins. And have your sins washed and cleansed away. And it's, it's an invitation to come to Him and turn over to Him the, the burden of the law that's brought you in jeopardy and judgment and receive instead His gift and His life. It's this, it's this wonderful, gracious invitation that's coming to you. And yet, it's also a command. God is saying in this invitation, He's commanding you to present yourself to Him to obey Him. Take my yoke upon you. Take it upon you. Receive my command. It's light. I'll be meek. I'll be good to you. Come under my command. Let's move on now and look at verse 18. One more point we want to make here. Verse 18 says, And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. There you have it again, by the way. The shift is from one kingdom to another, from darkness to the kingdom of the Son of Love. And here's the, the third idea here. Saving faith rescues you from slavery to sin as you give yourself in conversion to Christ. And as a result, you become a slave of righteousness. Saving faith rescues you from the power and embondagement of sin, and yet it brings you under the force of a, a power that prevails even more. Your relationship with sin begins with, the, in a sense, your voluntary act, your own presentation to give yourself to sin, but sin at some point in time takes over and exerts itself. Talk to anyone who's bound in some pornography, they can't, uh, in so, like an addiction to pornography, or some addictive drug, or some point of repeated behavior, where at first they went into it seeking their own benefits, and they made their own decisions, but now it's got hold of them. And even if they wanted to, they don't feel like they can break free. You start into sin thinking that you're exerting your own power and your own choices, but very soon it takes over and takes control of your life. And the phrase goes that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. It just overpowers you. And at some point, you're bound to it. But the same goes in salvation. When you come to Christ, in faith, you obediently yield yourself up to Him. And you surrender your obedient faith to Him, but then the life of faith you live is not lived in your own power. He takes over. He begins to, to develop impulses of obedience and, and, bond, and, and a, a binding to himself that begins to control and govern your lives. And, and you begin to follow him in obedient faith because his own life is being poured through you. And his righteousness is beginning to work in you. And he produces in you what you can't produce by your own power. He produces his own purpose and his own design that he made you for. When you falter, well, He corrects you and He chastens you and He disciplines you, but He keeps owning you in the obedience that He made you for. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul says this. This is why Paul can say this, by the way, knowing that this act of obedience to sin brings us in bondage to sin, but this act of obedience to Christ and believing Him brings us under the control and domain of His righteousness. He says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Isn't that wonderful? God is the one who's going to do this. God's the one that's going to fulfill it. Look, 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 we've talked about this in the last weeks, that our body, our flesh is filled with the contagion of sin. And that contagion of sin is driving us away from obeying God. It's driving us in the flesh. It's this is where the enemy is still percolating his powers within us. We're new creatures in Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're a new man in Christ, but you still got an old, unredeemed body. You've been redeemed. You're in a relationship with him. But your body, your body is still sick with sin. And that sickness of the flesh is resistant against the work of the Spirit. But if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God within you. And the Spirit of God is opposed to the power of your flesh. And here's the question for the believer. Which power do you think is going to prevail? Which power do you think is going to prevail? Galatians 5.17 says this, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. It's true. It's true. That if my spirit is a new spirit in Jesus Christ, and the spirit of God dwells and abides within me, he's going to win. He's going to prevail. He's going to produce in me a victory and a righteousness and a triumph and an ongoing procession and obedience that rises above the claim of sin against me. 
That's why Paul can say with confidence in Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making a request for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel until from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. His righteousness takes over. His life takes over. You're, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness, he says. A slave. A slave to righteousness. That's it. You know, Paul in verse 19 is going to apologize basically for using this analogy of being a slave. It's such a heart in the Roman world. Slavery was such an ugly and such a harsh thing. And, and yet Paul is using this analogy because he wants in a very visceral manner to convince those that he's writing to of the complete exchange that takes hold of them when they turn out from sin and they turn into Christ. When they, he's trying to convince them how wonderfully and completely they are released from the harrowing bondage to sin into an overwhelming bondage to Jesus Christ to be right and to follow him. It lays hold of them. They're freed from sin, but now, oh, they're bound to righteousness and a righteousness that will never die away. So here's the idea there. The idea is that sin is a power greater than yourself. And when you give it yourself to it, it takes over. Be cautioned, young men and young women. When you give yourself to sin, it will take over. But here's the other point. So is the righteousness you give yourself to when you turn your life to Jesus Christ. His power sets you free from your sins and makes you right through Him. And it's a power that takes hold of you and captivates you and grants you power to say to sin and Satan, I'm free from you. God forbid. <laughs> May it never be that I continue in your ways. God forbid that I ever continue presenting my body as a weapon for your warfare against my God. God forbid that I should give my body as a weapon of your warfare against His light and His truth. My Savior, my King, my Lord. I'm bound to Him. My body has been presented to Him as an instrument of His warfare against you. And I'm going to be victorious. And He's going to be victorious through me. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful promise. And what a wonderful call. And so the question still comes to us. What kingdom are you going to give yourself to? What kingdom are you going to give yourself to? By the way, here's the pattern for victory in your life. The way that you escape the bondage of sin is you repented and you turn from that sin and you turn to Jesus Christ. And as temptation comes upon you and as you live your Christian life, follow that pattern. Now, I'm turning from that. I'm not yielding myself to that. I'm not presenting myself to that. Oh, because I'm a new man in Christ. I'm continuing with the decision I made and the commitment I made. Lord, I'm turning into you and the power that you've given me. As I've received you, I'm going to walk in you. I give myself to you and I present myself to you. And the victory that comes through obedience, surrender.